Fort McHenry in Baltimore's Harbor is where a key battle took place during the War of 1812 against the British. These are the ramparts we watched, and this is the flag. It was the flag flying overhead that became America's symbol of patriotism. Join me for a very special taste of history from Baltimore. Nothing says America more than the Star Spangled Banner. Today I have a very special menu for you. Eel and mussel bisque, followed by a fesson en croûte, which is a nice little appetizer, and then the pièce de résistance, the veal shank. My eel and mussel bisque is a very unique recipe. Eel was plentiful and still is plentiful today and is still very popular in many parts of the world. We start off by first taking some mussels, I'm going to just cook them to get the liquid from the mussel that adds onto the bisque. You want a hot pot, and I'm going to get the mussels right here. Cover them with white wine. Add some shallots right in there, a little bit of garlic, and put it back on the fire and let it sit there. I want to get all the liquid from the mussels out so I can later incorporate it into my bisque. The reason I use both the eel and the mussel is because the mussel gives a nice color to it. It's just presentation. I got a dutchie ready, butter, I have some shallots, a little bit of garlic, All right, now it goes on the fire. The eel is almost built like a snake, but it has a lot of fine bones in it. So when you want to cook it all the way through, you can just pull it off so you don't have a lot of the tiny bones in your soup. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be nice. Always make sure you put the cognac in a smaller bowl because you don't want to create a Molotov cocktail. It's most bisques that you make, the deglazing with the cognac gives it a very distinct flavor. Now I got some white wine in here. I got some leeks that are washed, because remember leeks are very salty. You want to just take the white part for the most part, not too much uh, a leek. And then I'm going to have a few mushrooms. Now it goes over to my fire, into my reducing eel. More white wine. And salt, we're gonna recheck the salt later. A couple more times, we're gonna add the salt. And pepper goes in there. While I'm reducing that, I'm gonna check on the mussels that I made earlier. Perfect. I'm going to put them back on the fire on the low simmer. I just want to kind of reduce it more because all I want from that is the liquid that came out of the, the mussels. Okay. Let me get this stuff away here because what I got to make sure now, before it reduces down, I'll make sure I get the. Uh... Oh boy. Oh, it's beautiful. We want to cook this just long enough so that I can later peel some of the, the meat off the bone. It takes about 10 minutes or so, but the flavor is good. Now it's going to give some thyme and heavy cream. It's a little bit more pepper. You can really taste the cognac, the deglazing. I'm going to check it one more time. Beautiful, rich, spectacular.
All right, let me get the muscles over here because really all I want from the muscles right now is the liquid. What is in here? Now I'm straining the liquid in here. Some more heavy cream in here. I'm going to check on the, uh, the flavor. Oh boy, excellent. So I'm with some Permanier, which is equal flour, equal butter. Then I'm going to take it back on the fire to reduce down a little bit. Parsley. Now the eel, I take right in the bottom of my soup dish. Next, I'm going to take a couple of nice spoons of my mussels. Beautiful. This is my eel and mussel bisque. Spectacular is the word. Unbelievable. You get a flavor of the eel and the mussels. Beautiful, really beautiful. On every sporting event and on the 4th of July, you heard our national anthem. But did you know how the Star Spangled Banner came about? In 1807, Congress imposed an embargo on trade with Britain and France after British naval ships started boarding American merchant vessels, seizing ships and cargo, and kidnapping sailors. President Jefferson didn't want to risk a new war with Britain, so Congress decided it was time to fight back with similar tactics. You, the private citizen, could come in with your vessel. You asked for a letter of mark, and this made you a licensed privateer that separates you from being a pirate and capturing the British merchant trade, and so it became a very profitable business, as long as you weren't captured. And so the era of fast and stealthy privateer ships like the Lynx was born. These ships were basically the fastest ships on the sea, so we were also capable of running blockades. They captured over 2,000 British ships. Why was Baltimore considered a nest of pirates? Baltimore was very well known uh, during the War of 1812 as the prize of the Chesapeake Bay. This is where all the privateers operated out of. What happened in August of 1814 as the British marched on Washington, D.C., they defeated the American Army of Bladesburg, Maryland, torched the city of Washington. The attack on Washington was so successful that this gave them an opportunity to make this dash on Baltimore. Before British naval vessels sailed into Baltimore Harbor to attack Fort McHenry, British troops took a Maryland resident hostage, Dr. William Beans. I was captured by the British, put on board one of their ships, and I knew not what my fate was going to be until my good friend, Francis Scott Key, came to my rescue. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer and amateur poet from Washington who was negotiating the release of hostages. He arrived just at the moment when the British were preparing their bombardment of Fort McHenry. The battle raged around Key as his fellow Americans desperately fought to defend Fort McHenry. He was seeing the battle from the point of view of the British, and it didn't look good. It looked terrible for us, horrible in fact. And he watched it all night long, so you can imagine how gut-wrenching that would be. So he got a little piece of paper. He scrawls down the poem, which was called The Defense of Fort McHenry. And it was only later that lyric was put as was custom of the time, to a song that everyone knew, which just happened to be a British drinking song. To an Akron in half where he sat. This was like a song everyone knew, but here are the new lyrics, the Star Spangled Banner. So here we have a copy of the first printing of it. Today we all know the words to the Star Spangled Banner. But it was not our national anthem until 100 years after it was written.
My pheasant on grud is such a simple dish, but so great, you can use it for entertaining any time. Just get a little bit of heat in there, and all I'm gonna add in there is a little bit of butter. Butter, garlic. I have shallots, good amount of shallots, and some onion, and some summer squash, any kind of squash, summer squash, zucchini. Put this back on the fire for a little bit. All you really wanna do is just really quickly sweat it, no color, so that the onions are translucent. It's a really easy dish. Smoked pheasant. Pheasant is available in many, many, many regular supermarkets and specialty shops. And then what you're gonna do is just cut it either way you like it. Again, there is really no right, no wrong. I prefer a very small dice, and you're gonna see in a moment why, so it's easier to put it in the puff door. In Europe, pheasant was reserved for the well-to-do, the rich only, because the common folks could not go and hunt. In this country, however, it was for everybody. So and with pheasant became very, very popular and plenty thereof. So pheasant is basically new world democracy. All right, so you're gonna dice it up, like I have done already. Put it in, and now I'm just gonna add it into my mixture of squash and onion over the fire. So I'm gonna deglaze it, a little bit of Madeira or red wine. You want to make sure when you do it that you, everything reduces dry. Put your parsley into it. You can also put some thyme, some sage, whatever you really feel around when you do it a couple of times. And now, I just have a little bit of the brown sauce. Any brown sauce works. There's so much flavor in the uh, actual mixture. So you're going to do like so. You go any store where you can buy a puff dough. So what you want to do, you can make them now smaller, bigger. The ones I have in the oven already are a little bit in the bigger size. They're like a three biter, but you can make them smaller. What I do, I put egg wash twice. I egg wash the bottom. There you go. When I do mine, when I do mine, I do a little fork in the bottom so later the steam can kind of evaporate. If you make it at home, let it sit up for maybe an hour in the refrigerator, it's easier to work with. For demonstration purposes, I can show you. Just put a little stuffing in the middle, and then you're gonna do is you fold it over, and you can just crimp it with your hand like so, it doesn't need any more like that, look at that. So put a little spoon in there. Like I said, you can make them smaller, bigger, any size for a dish size, between the seven to be a three biter. Very important, you wanna actually really, really good, one more time, egg wash the top. I get a question asked so many times. We use a lot of puff pastry in the 18th century. Is that because I like to use it? No, matter of fact, puff pastry was one of the dominant pastries they used. Not just also in savory, but also in sweets, you know, like uh, the wall of warm with berries, what have you. And uh, uh, puff pastry, like the, the turkey pot pies, the lobster pies, all have been done with uh, puff pastry. Let me check my little handiwork here. It's going to take about eight minutes at 350. You just want to make sure that the puff is... Uh, Nice and hot. That the puff is uh, is done because the, everything inside is already cooked. My pheasant and puff though is pretty hot, but not as hot as it got on that very fateful night in Fort McHenry. And you know, the bombs bursting in there were for real and very frightening. <laughs> He talks about over the ramparts we watch. What he's talking about is over the walls that we watch. So rampart is a, a French term used in early fortifications here in the United States. Is that the bomb? What we're looking at here, Walter, is really the atom bomb of the early 19th century. This is a 200-pound cast iron exploding shell. These were thrown up from a bomb ship two miles away from here. It would go one mile up into the heavens before beginning its downward plunge upon the fort. And if this fuse was set just right, it would explode hot fragments of metal coming down on the 1,000 defenders here at Fort McHenry. There are accounts of the grounds moving from the concussion of the artillery for 25 straight hours. They could actually hear these in downtown Philadelphia 100 miles away from here. So this is the most powerful weapon of the War of 1812. The battle raged throughout the stormy night with the Americans vastly outnumbered. 
and expected to lose to the far superior British Navy's bombardment. Early in the morning, the sun hit the flag that was flying over McHenry, and it was obvious to everyone that we prevailed, that America had won. That our flag was still there. It's the most famous flag, uh, really, in American history. It's 15 stars and 15 stripes. And this was the official flag of the United States from 1795 until 1818. So from that moment till today, whenever a new state is admitted to the Union, the first flag is always flown here at midnight on July the 4th. The wheel shank is the main course for our Star Spangled Menu, which is very popular our days still all over Europe. And actually it's something that you order in restaurants and it's usually for two or three people depending. It's so simple to make, but there's a couple of things you want to do. I have a Movielle roasting pan from Europe, same pans that our 18th century compadres used. I put some butter in the pan and then I put all the vegetable right in there that I already pre-cut. So I have Brussels sprouts, I have snap peas, I get some onion. And then any kind of root vegetable, I mean, celery, uh, parsnip, really, there is no way no, whatever you prefer. And basically all you do is put it on the bottom of your roasting pan. Now, the actual shank itself, you want to just take them, lay them down, and you want to be very generous with salt. You want some paprika, which will next one has color later and flavor. And I have some garlic here. And then it's going to get a very good amount of pepper. And you put this in the oven at about 375 until you get a nice crisp skin on it and then you might want to lower the oven a little bit until the meat shrinks on both sides. And the last thing I'm going to do is take some oil, any kind of oil, vegetable oil, any kind of oil. Be generous with the oil over it. And then you can put a little stock on the bottom or water or I like a little red wine on the bottom. And just so until the vegetables gets kind of soft so it doesn't uh, really burn on the bottom. So I just put like a cup or so of uh, red wine. And now it goes in my beehive. And in about an hour's time, you're gonna have a meal that is befitting the Star Spangled Banner. My wheel shank should be done. Oh yeah. Whew. gorgeous. Well, look at that, huh? <laughs> now, the way you serve it is you just take a little knife, look here, and just loosen up the bone on the other side here. This is actually how it's still served in Europe. In there, by the way, is all the marrow, which is unbelievable. It has so much flavor in there, look at that. That is like, oh, loosen it up a little bit. Hmm. Now, the, the, the shank, what you do, just cut it. What makes it so unique is all the cartilage is in there. There's so much flavor. And now, what you, the normally the way you serve that is you would take the uh, the root vegetable that are on the bottom of the pan, and you're just going to take them and put them on the bottom of the platter. It's very delicious, especially the Brussels sprouts in there. Gets it some nice flavor. And then you put the Put the meat right back on it again, like it once was before. This is the wheel shank. Huh. The flavor is just absolutely spectacular. Slow cooked, the wood vegetables, spectacular dish. All for Star Spangled Banner. It's hard to believe that it took Congress over 100 years after the Battle of Fort McHenry to officially recognize the Star Spangled Banner as our national anthem. The War of 1812 is largely forgotten, but it was the war in which America found its identity. We know the song, but we don't know the war. We were a federation of states. 
but after the war, we were Americans. And that's what the Star Spangled Banner did. It gave the Americans a sense of who they were. The War of 1812 was a crucial moment when people first began experimenting with using popular culture, using songs, poems, ballads, as a means of rallying the public to support a cause. It's the first declared war in a modern democracy, and it's the first time that public opinion and popular culture really matter in shaping political events. It's interesting that it wasn't until 1931 that it was voted in by Congress to be the national anthem that we know. One of the favorite desserts during the 18th century was the bread pudding. Diana. Hi there. <laughs> so good to have you here. It's really a, a good vehicle to use any leftovers that you have, any dried fruits or nuts or any of your favorite ingredients can end up in a bread pudding. And the reason that you wanted to do that, because making bread in the 18th century, imagine making a fire, procuring the right kind of flour, you didn't want to just discard it really easily. For this particular recipe, we used the salilan, which we make it now. A Diana. spiced black currant bread pudding. So we're going to start here with eight eggs, and we're just going to whisk them up, get the yolks broken, and then we're going to add just a cup of each brown sugar and white sugar. All right, here we go. Beautiful. The brown sugar really helps to keep it moist and chewy. Perfect. Now some spices. We have cinnamon and How clove. How much you want? A teaspoon? About a teaspoon. Okay. Clove. You can season to your liking, of cinnamon. course. Cinnamon. All right. Pinch of salt. And now we have some half and half. You can use cream if you're, you know, low on half and half or really want the extra richness, but four cups. That's cream today. Extra rich on the taste extra of history. Extra rich. Mmm. Oh, yes. I see the flavor already. Look at that. That's right. Perfect. So it's just a simple custard here. And just make sure it's good and whisked together. We have our cubed Sally Lun here. We've just taken the crust off. Um, it can get a little tough when you bake it. So crust off about one to two inch pieces, and they're just in a bowl big enough that I can pour the custard over the bread without it overflowing. Fantastic. You can go ahead and squish that up for me. Just want to really get the bread thoroughly soaked. You can push it as much as you'd like, or some people let it soak out. Continue to soak the bread until 80% of the liquid is absorbed so that you don't end up with big pieces of dry bread in the middle of your pudding. Because if they don't get, if the liquid doesn't soak in it, they stay dry. And then exactly. Unless you have a not too excited bread pudding. Not too exciting. And I'm going to add these currants in for you. Now the currants you soaked in rum. Absolutely. It's really important to soak the currants not only uh, to prevent them from sinking and getting stuck to the bottom, but also just another layer of flavor and really helps them plump up so that when you bite in, it's just a juicy burst of rum. You know, I went to Guyana. I yeah. actually visited El Dorado. So it actually makes me feel good to use Guyanese rum in our recipe. Excellent. Isn't that fantastic? Straight into our baking dish. Beautiful. And in the oven it goes. In the oven it goes. It's as easy as that. How much time for cooking, this one? Uh, 30 minutes covered and then about 15 minutes uncovered to get the top nice and toasted and brown. Fantastic. Diana, thank you for showing me your black currant spice bread pudding. You're very welcome. And cheers to America's independence. <laughs>